Hello, I'm John, and this is the Mask Face Journal, and this is what I read this week. Batgirl and the Birds of Prey number one, written by Julie and Shauna Benson and art by Claire Rowe. I say one thing. You need to have read the Rebirth issue for this one, because even though it's a number one, it's still part two of the story. Batgirl and Black Canary is hunting for people who has information on this new version of Oracle that is selling information to the mob. This is somewhat hindered by the fact that these same people are on Huntress's hit list. What struck me as odd was the portrayal of Black Canary. Her investment in this mission and her attitude towards Batgirl seemed very different from the Rebirth issue. There she was reluctant to help, grumpy and very insistent that this mission would be the only one. Here, she's cheery, on good terms with Barbara and eager to help. The art here is also odd. The actions are clear to follow and the line work is good, but the faces are a lot of times terribly drawn, at least in my opinion. Also, the eye holes in Batgirl's mask are so large that they could not possibly conceal her identity from anyone. Supergirl Rebirth, written by Steve Orlando and art by Manuela Lupacino. I didn't read the preceding Supergirl series, so I can't say for sure, but this seems to be somewhat building on that while simultaneously borrowing a lot from the current Supergirl TV show. For example, it's set in National City. She works for the DEO, has adopted Kara Danvers as a secret identity as opposed to Linda Lee Danvers, which she's classically known as, and her costume looks a lot like the TV show version, with a skirt instead of her kind of weird looking red panty things. As a setup, up, this is all right. With the exception of the final page, I don't think you need much foreknowledge to be able to understand what's going on, and even that I can't be fully certain of since I didn't read the previous series. Supergirl's character also seems more in line with her TV show counterpart. She seems to have a more positive outlook on life from what I imagine a former Red Lantern to have. The art in this is really quite nice. Clear, clean, easy to read. I'm gonna give at least the first story arc a shot. Suicide Squad number one, written by Rob Williams and art by Jim Lee. I can already spot a problem that this book is going to have, frequency of release. With Jim Lee on art duties, there is going to be significant delays. It definitely makes sense that this is divided into two parts, where Jason for book takes over on art duties in the backup story that focuses on Deadshot. This book confuses me, because it plays it like it's the first time the Suicide Squad has been assembled, even though that is clearly not the case. I blame that on awkward exposition for the sake of new readers. What else is awkward is the fact that an entire page of this book is dedicated to Killer Croc vomiting into his space helmet. The roster of the squad is the exact same one from the movie with the exception of Slipknot, so yay for movie comic synergy. That never backfires. The art. I'll never understand Jim Lee's obsession with putting seemingly random lines all over people's faces. Personally, I kind of tuned them out, but friends of mine definitely has issues with them. I like the art better in the Deadshot backup story, but that might be down to the coloring more than anything else. Harley Quinn number two, written by Jimmy Palmiotti and Amanda Connor, and art by Chad Harden and John Timms. So yeah, zombies. That's what happens here. People got turned into modern era rage zombies from eating hot dogs accidentally made from an alien, camouflaging himself as a cow. Tot's not a scroll, y'all. Fair bit of warning. As I was reading this, I had not 10 minutes before watched the season 2 finale of iZombie, so I was already kinda in the mood for something like this, and it might affect my judgement. Last issue I was not that into, but I enjoyed this a bit more. It's still a bit wordy for my taste. As someone who sometimes writes stuff, I understand the urge to pour words on a page, but it gets a bit much here sometimes. The art. The book has two artists, but if you didn't know that, I think you might not notice. Now the credits listings are not very clear, but I think the similarity comes down to the inking being done by just one of them. It's nice looking, slightly cartoonier, exaggerated comic art that I personally find appealing. Green Arrow number 5, written by Benjamin Percy and art by Juan Ferreira. As far as I can tell, this is the conclusion to this storyline, but I'm not sure that it's written as a story with an end, but as a continuous narrative, where the end is just the beginning of the next event, so to speak, if that makes any sense. Ollie makes some choices here that might set up a status quo that should be familiar to anyone who's read 70s Green Arrow. In any case, I like this, maybe not as much as previous parts, but it's still a solid book, and I'm looking forward to the next issue. The art is still good, but again, I feel like this has been better in previous issues. Justice League number 3, written by Brian Hitch and art by Tony S. Daniel. I don't think it's possible to spoil this issue, because I have no idea what's going on here. We got aliens, 
magic, crazy ancient consciousnesses with some unknown agenda, drawing their forms from basically constructing giant Jaegers out of thousands of people. Also, Superman has to go to the Earth's core to stop earthquakes. I don't know where this is going, but I'm most certainly interested to see how or if this ties together at all. I can't say I'm bored by this, just enjoying the insanity. Superman number 5, written by Peter Tomasi and art by Patrick Gleason. I kinda love this. It's hard to make a review of a single part in the middle of a story, but man, this was badass. Everyone on Team Superman gets something to do in this. It's action-packed, emotional and deeply satisfying. Elevator pitch for this issue. Superman fighting the Eradicator in the Batcave on the moon. It makes the logistics of building the Batcave underneath Wayne Manor seem like a piece of cake in comparison. Just saying. Batman number 5, written by Tom King and art by David Finch. I... I don't know how to really talk about this. It's good. Really quite good. It's a battle where Batman has to take down the mind-warped super-being Gotham. We get some good action, a lot of revelations, and we get to see Batman do something I'm not sure we've ever seen him do in one of his solo books before. But what really sticks out is the ending. Or more specifically, the narration of the ending. I can't talk about it, that would spoil it. And I can't talk about much else because it's what we're left with. What I can say is I'm really interested to see where this is going. Alright, that was what I read this week. Did you like this video? Please like, comment, subscribe and share this video with all of your friends and enemies and whatever. Did you not like it? Please let me know in the comments and also share the video. Yeah, that's, that's it for this week.